Good afternoon. I'm Joy Connolly, President of the American Council of Learned Societies. I'm delighted to welcome you all to our discussion today, How Do We Get There? Accelerating Diversity in Slow to Change Humanities Fields. This event is part of our new public programming series at ACLS, Humanistic Knowledge in the 21st Century. ACLS lives by the principle of inclusive excellence. That is, we believe in a core, a core element in excellent scholarship is the broad participation of and leadership by people who bring diverse voices and perspectives to the work. The events of the last year, and particularly the growing visible anger, public anger at the chronic devaluation of black lives in American society are powerful evidence for the necessity for white people of taking a hard look at the stories and exemplars we're used to living by, even if we're also trying to reshape them. As white people acknowledge how these stories and exemplars make life comfortable for us at the expense of others, it's also our civic responsibility to figure out how to change, starting by listening to and heeding people of color. So too in the fields and areas of study in the humanities and social sciences that ACLS represents. Support for underrepresented scholars and scholarship on underrepresented and underserved communities and histories is a top priority in the strategic plan ACLS published this past May. And I just came from a gathering of learned society directors where we're discussing how to accelerate initiatives undertaken in the societies and in their diverse memberships in inclusion, diversity, and equity. So today, I hope you'll be prompted to think. I know you will be prompted to do that by the liveliness of our, of our discussants, to ask questions of them and of yourselves and return to your department or your students or your network of fellow independent scholars or your friends or family or some mixture of all of these and continue the discussion and thought about action with them. ACLS's member societies are key to the advancement of anti-racist initiatives in the academy. So I'm especially pleased that this discussion today will be moderated by Dr. Pauline Salika, who became executive director of the Society of for Architectural Historians after many years working in museums, including 14 years at the Chicago Art Institute. Pauline, it's an honor to welcome you and our eminent discussants. So thank you so much and over to you to introduce our guests. Thank you, Joy. It's really an honor to be here um, moderating this panel, particularly since the Society of Architectural Historians um, has taken on the goal of uh, reorganizing our society from um, a dominant to an equity culture. Um, many of our fellow learned societies are, are on the same path, many ahead of us, uh, some behind us, but um, SAH is committed to actually putting everything on the table, our policies, procedures, programs, governance, bylaws, everything, so that we can uh, carefully take things apart and reassemble them so that we really do achieve an equity culture. So thank you, I really appreciate um, all I'm going to learn from this panel today. So our panel, how do we get there? Accelerating diversity in the slow to change humanities fields um, is about to commence. I'll make very brief introductions of our distinguished participants and then we'll get right to the discussion. Here with me are Anita L. Allen, who is the Henry R. Silverman Professor of Law and Professor of Philosophy at the University of Pennsylvania Law School. She is an expert on privacy law, the philosophy of privacy, bioethics, and contemporary values. And she is recognized for scholarship about legal philosophy, women's rights, and race relations. Welcome, Anita. Thank you. Also with us is Philip Ewell, who is an associate professor of music theory at Hunter College of the City University of New York. His research specialties include Russian music and music theory, modal theory, critical race studies, and hip hop and popular music. His recent work examines race, gender, and other identities in American music theory. Welcome, Philip. Hi, great to be with you. 
And our final participant is Cord Whitaker, who is an associate professor of English at Wellesley College. He researches and teaches late medieval English literature, the history of race, religious and cultural conflict in the Middle Ages, and the modern literacy and political uses of medievalism. Welcome, Cord. Great to be with you today. Thank you. So we have a great lineup of questions here. And um, I, I would just like to, uh, before we get started, um, encourage all of you to share with us if, if, if you feel comfortable doing that, um, your own life lessons about, um, about the topics we're going to be discussing, um, DEI and anti-racism. And we know your lived experiences very valuable for us to learn from. So um, my first question is, the terms DEI and anti-racism are often conflated. What challenges arise from that conflation when it comes to homogeneity in your fields of study? And there are actually um, three prompts to this question. Um, one, what are the benefits of each when it comes to efforts to diversify your fields of study? Two, in your experience, does one or another produce better results? And three, what actions have you seen your colleagues or institutions take in either area that have been effective? I'm happy to start if, uh, if I can, if I may. Thank you. Great. So the first thing I think that the question uh, leads me to want to say is that um, we've had many discourses around uh, improving race relations and the representation of underrepresented minorities in higher education and in philosophy. To go back to the 1960s, we talked about racial integration. And then in the 1970s, we talked about affirmative action. Then in the 1980s, we talked about diversity, racial diversity. In the 1990s, we started talking about multiculturalism. In the 2000s, we started talking about diversity and inclusion. And in 2010, diversity, inclusion, and equity. Only in the last year, really, have we been talking a lot about, um, about anti-racism as the next phase in uh, what I see as a long history of, of semantic and, and, and action efforts to improve things. What I've seen in my uh, department of philosophy, I, I'm, I'm a lawyer who also is, has a secondary appointment in the philosophy department. I've been a vice provost at Penn. And what I've seen is that the only thing that works is hands-on direct action. So I'm very encouraged by the emphasis in anti-racism on not thinking that sitting back and not doing bad things means that you're doing good things because doing nothing is not doing good. So I believe that whether you're, you're using the mantle that we used five years ago or 10 years ago, uh, uh, it's important that it be hands-on and direct. I'll just give you a quick example. So the philosophy department at my university had not hired a black person uh, full-time on the tenure track since 1948 when I became vice provost for faculty, 1948. The person was, uh, was Bill Fontaine, William Fontaine, very important philosopher. When I was hired, I chose to go to the law school instead of going to the philosophy department for various reasons. So, so I don't count. Um, but when I became vice provost, I wanted to help the philosophy department overcome being stuck on not being able to hire a black person uh, in, 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 in many, 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 many decades. So I asked the department, what have you done? It turned out, oh, we formed a committee and we looked at uh, people of color and, we, and you know, we just, we came up blank and we just couldn't hire anybody. So it turned out that um, they had not done their homework properly, that there were organizations of African-American philosophers, including the Collegium of Black Women Philosophers that has not been consulted about possible candidates for tenure track jobs at my university. It also turned out that the job description for the uh, fields they were looking for did not include the word race anywhere in the description. And it is uh, for whatever reason, <laughs> good or bad, I think good, I mean, it's good. But there are almost no philosophers in America who don't work on race. So if you don't want someone who works on race, you probably don't want a black philosopher 
or, or a Latino philosopher or a Native American philosopher on your faculty. So I, I encourage them to rewrite the job description to include philosophy of race and race related studies, critical race theory, et cetera, in the description of the job, whether it's for ethics or epistemology or, or philosophy of mind, whatever, make it clear that race related philosophy counts. And guess what? They got tons of applications. They had three truly outstanding candidates they brought to campus uh, in a general search uh, who were all well-qualified. They end up hiring a man named Quayshon Spencer, who is a wonderful philosopher. He was easily tenured. We had to fight with Duke to keep him. Uh, and, and I think what the, what the story teaches us is that there needs to be hands-on effort and homework. And I think in my role as vice provost, I was able to use the power of my office to encourage the philosophy department to, um, to act affirmatively and aggressively. Now, what I did could have been done under the mantle of affirmative action or diversity or inclusion, but I think it was also very anti-racist, very anti-racist. Thank you, Anita. That's really an illuminating example. Uh, Cord, would you like to talk to us about, uh, you know, the terms DEI and anti-racism and uh, what challenges arise from the conflation of the two terms? Sure, you know, and, and, the, and I should be upfront that I speak from multiple professional perspectives. I mean, I speak as a practicing medievalist um, and medieval studies, of course, is a field that's been, you know, highly implicated and really was professionalized in, in many ways under the aegis of white supremacy and the um, uh, and European imperialist project. Uh, which, you know, of the 16th, 17th, 18th centuries. Um, but I also speak as someone who regularly consults on anti-racism and communication strategy. Um, you know, I, I work closely with a firm that does exactly that. So in that realm, I've, you know, seen this work done in academic cultures as well as outside of academic cultures and nonprofit and corporate cultures. I think it's really important to think about diversity, equity, and inclusion and anti-racism as, as in a kind of evolutionary relationship to one another. Um, you know, as Anita put it, diversity, equity, and inclusion. I mean, this term comes out of all of our talk of diversity that began to be a bit of a buzzword in the, the 90s, uh, became more and more of a buzzword in the aughts, and then inclusion has really only appeared in the term in the past uh, 15 years or so. And in some avenues, even later than that. Whereas anti-racism, of course, highly popularized by Ibram X. Kendi, um, is something we're really talking about, you know, just in the past couple of years. Well, in my experiences as a medievalist, anti-racism has required the platform of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, rather similar to what Dr. Allen was saying about the philosophy department that she had to work so closely with. Um, many of the, the pitfalls of the way that racism, the way that white supremacy can be deeply embedded in my field were not fully revealed. They were not able to be fully brought to light until there became a, a critical mass of scholars of color working in medieval studies. There have always been, mind you, there have always been scholars of color working in medieval studies but not a critical mass thereof. That critical mass came to be precisely because of the diversity and inclusion efforts that you know, have seen more students of color brought into universities where medieval studies is you know, relatively well-funded, relatively present, et cetera, um, such that they were able to you know, take the classes become interested and find an outlet for that interest. And increasingly find faculty of color to foster those interests, whether those faculty of color are directly in medieval studies or associated enough that they could help foster that interest. 
So without those diversity and inclusion efforts that have grown that critical mass, then the kind of collective action that's much more germane to anti-racism that's been done over the past several years would not have been possible. And that's included, you know, uh, some, some initiatives I've been heavily involved with, the founding of the Medievalists of Color organization, for instance. You know, we, our numbers are constantly growing, um, but, you know, it's a group of folks who work in medieval studies, whose home disciplines are all sorts of other disciplines, you know, English, history, foreign languages, archaeology, anthropology, et cetera. But we've been able to foreground and center the ways in which white supremacy continues to operate within the field. We've been able to foreground and center at the major conferences of the field um, and in major venues, major publications in the field. We've been able to foreground and center the ways that students of color who might be interested get locked out. The ways that they get, the ways that they get directed away which only feeds on and, and really you know, exacerbates a, a general popular and academic cultural understanding of medieval studies and of the Middle Ages as homogeneously European and as homogeneously white, which is patently false, but which is the mainstream understanding of the historical period. Um, so that's something we're constantly working against as well. So, I will just say that from my purview, you know, DEI and anti-racism, they work hand in hand. We would not be able to take the anti-racist actions we've taken over the past few years without the ways that DEI has made, um, has made the changes, incremental as they are, within the medieval studies community possible. So DEI is, is kind of the foundation that has, that has um, helped the field develop Thank you. Thank you, Cord. Um, Philip, would you would you like to address the question? Do you remember the question? I do. I do. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Yeah. Um, thanks so much for uh, for for the invite and, and for uh, this great panel. It's great to be here with um, Drs. Whitaker and Allen. And I have to, I think I should say straight off the bat that I'm something of a newbie, really, to some of this work. I, I am a music theorist. I'm a cellist. And I think you had mentioned that I, I, I've worked in Russian music theory too. So I'm also a Russianist within the field of music theory. And it really wasn't until um, I had uh, essentially a 10 year battle at Hunter College in CUNY that started in 2014 that kind of set me on a path to start thinking about some of these um, issues. So, you know, I really give lots of credit to people like uh, Anita um, and Cord and for all the work, the decades of work that they've been doing that you know, has just made things so much better. I like uh, Anita's uh, kind of historical, uh, you know, walking us through the decades really because you know, she's been there for, for, mu for some of it, much of it. And um, there is most certainly a linear aspect to it. So, and then to follow up on what Cord was saying, there is, uh, there's this hand in hand aspect. So there's a linear aspect to this progress, but I, I, I push back against the linear part a little bit and I kind of hit the circular regression that we keep having. And that's also part of the picture. And um, the DEI I find tries to focus on the linear progress. We're not there yet, but we're making uh, strides. And that's great, it's all true. I, I'm not saying it's not. I think the anti-racism is more willing to think about the circular regression that we have. The, the, the battles that continue that continually happen as uh, you know cord cites ibram kendi and kendi often cites about the battle between essentially between racist ideas and anti-racist ideas um so with in the field of music theory with certainty and i should say the academic study of music generally uh, we don't have that critical mass that you uh, cited cord and and i think that's great that you know you can have a group called medievalists of color I think some of the things you cited in one of your writings were, was from 2017. And, you know, I certainly, you know, keep my finger on the pulse of some of those issues because it's very relevant, frankly, to the academic study of music and uh, music theory with certainty because we, we talk about medieval music theorists quite literally, you know, Boethius and Leonin and Periton and maybe some names you know, I, I don't know, but we are, uh, we are very much mired in 
a historical white supremacy that really is in, in music theory in the United States that really is only showing itself in the last, well, months maybe, let's say year or two, a couple of events have happened. And finally, people can utter the words white supremacy and not have people fall off their chair. When I say uh, the, the words historical roots in white supremacy, and that's what the academic study of music is, um, you're really just stating a fact. If you look back to the 19th century, when music institutions started, like the New England Conservatory or the Oblin Conservatory, Yale, Yale School of Music was 1894, the New York Philharmonic, 1842, Metropolitan Opera, 1883. Nobody is going to try to say that the musical institutions that began in the 19th century in the United States were not deeply rooted in white supremacist thought and patriarchal thought. No one's going to say that. I mean, that's just what the 19th century was. That's just, those are statements of fact, really. Uh, well, you know, we've been essentially uh, saying that that's what we need to do in the academic study of music all the way up until today. And we have very, very skillfully kind of hidden many of the racial and gender and other identity aspects of what we do. Uh, so much so that it's, um, it's gotten to be a big issue in the field. Uh, to come back to the original question, DEI versus anti-racism, I find that DEI initiatives, not always, but often, represent something of a smokescreen. There's something of kind of performative allyship, checking of boxes. We have a DEI committee, we're good. We appointed a DEI person and paid that person a nice big salary as an administrator. We're good, we're good to go. Uh, whereas, uh, and I get this from, from, from Ibrahim Kendi, the anti-racist work, which is uncovering white supremacist roots, whether it's medieval studies or, or music theory, that's hard work. That there are some bitter pills to swallow in there. The closer I find that you actually get to uttering the word white, and the closer you get to uttering the word male, or let's say non-cisgender men, the harder it is for power structures, which are in fact often white cisgender men, um, it gets harder and harder to make these changes that we're talking about. So that's you know my 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 brief take on DEI versus anti-racism. <laughs> there they work hand in hand. I agree with Cord. There is a, 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 a an arc of of terminology and things that we're using. I agree with Anita. But I do find that ultimately anti-racist work requires a little bit, a little bit more energy. A little, it's a little harder, and um, and and it, and it will it will get more pushback because ultimately, the word that I keep coming back to is power. It's associated with power. Who has it and who does not? And if we understand that the people who have power historically in the United States, again, a statement of fact. This isn't open for debate. Have been white cisgender men then we can see uh, why in a field like my own music theory, uh, it, it's very unnerving to, to, to have uh, things out there. Like we need to have more people of color in the societies. We need to study the music of more non-cisgender men in our concerts, et cetera, et cetera. Very much what like Cord was talking about. Thank you. Thank you. This is all, this is all quite illuminating. For all three of you, your research is a testament to how when people who have traditionally been excluded from homogenous fields assume rightful positions, both new knowledge and the promise of diversifying the field itself are expanded. And uh, in, indeed, sometimes some fields succeed or are succeeding at that. Uh, the question is, what in the current structure has facilitated your journey toward um, innovation? And what obstacles have you encountered that you would advocate be removed? I could just, you know, share a very quick anecdote. Um, you know, and this goes right back to, uh, to what I was just saying about the popular perception of the, you know, historical period known as the Middle Ages. One of the reasons that in my work, I deal not only with medieval evidence itself, but then I also deal with medievalism, um, the modern 
understandings of the period that are often laden with, um, you know, with white supremacist prejudices as well as cisgendered prejudices is precisely because I was told in, in any number of ways that the Middle Ages were, were not for me professionally in a number of avenues. But one of them that stuck, sticks out the most because it was perhaps the most blatant did come from, you know, it actually did come from a fellow scholar of color in a different field but who had internalized the, you know, in, in, internalized a prejudice against uh, the Middle Ages, or the study of the Middle Ages. And when I first met this person, she looked me up and down, she found out what I did. And this was while I was in graduate school. She looked me up and down with the most disdainful look you can possibly imagine. And she looked me up and down and she said, you're a medievalist? And then went on to accuse me in no uncertain terms of being a race traitor. That is quite an obstacle for someone to overcome in order to pursue an academic field. Now, of course, you know, I, had my other networks that were able to, that I was able to turn to. Um, I was fortunate to have that. I have since talked to other scholars, many of them who are scholars in other fields, some of whom have left scholarship entirely, who were interested in becoming scholars of the Middle Ages until they too had a similar experience. And they did not have the robust networks I had to, reaffirm that my identity as a person who identifies as African-American was perfectly commensurate with an identity as a scholar of the Middle Ages. Mm. Um, it's those kind of networks that, that we have to build, right? It's those kind of peer networks um, you know, and, and you know, and the, the kind of the kind of organizing work that I've done through medievalists of color, some of the organizing work I've done in my my institutions, as well, um, you know, is a is a step in that direction. I mean, that's something I I strive to do, but I often go back to remembering that moment because that moment was was a fulcrum. I could have said, "Oh dear, you're right. Maybe I am a race traitor." And I should examine that and step away from that. Or, um, or I could have done what I did and think, mm, I don't think that's right. And let me reaffirm with my, my networks um, that it's not. <laughs> and then go on to do, you know, go on to do academic work that exposes the ways that the academy has uh, has been integral in the creation of that fallacy. I have a feeling a lot of women have had experiences like that too. Not that they've been called traitors, but that they've been led to believe they weren't good enough. Thank you, Cord. Anita, do you want to go ahead? I was just saying that this woman is an example of what you were describing. <laughs> First of all, philosophy, as most people know, is a very male field. Like if you Google philosophy, probably the image that will come up will be a, a white European looking man with a beard or maybe Confucius, but you will almost never, if you Google image, have the first picture come up to be a, a, a black person or a woman. When I went into philosophy in the um, 1970s, um, the only black women in history who had obtained PhDs in philosophy were Angela Davis, the famous political radical from the 1960s, Joyce Mitchell Cook, who had obtained her PhD from uh, Yale, and a woman named Laverne Shelton, who'd received her PhD from the University of Wisconsin. All three superbly educated Black women. Angela Davis got her philosophy PhD in, um, in Europe from a famous German university. So, but, but all three of them were denied tenure. So the moment when I decided to pursue philosophy, I didn't have a single example of a woman who entered philosophy who had succeeded through the tenure track. And, and yet I went ahead and did it anyway. 
And I did it anyway out of admiration, primarily for Angela Davis. I, I was not that familiar with her, the part of Angela Davis that's the, um, you know, I bought the guns that were used to commit these horrible crimes in a courtroom in, in California. But the Angela Davis that I was focused on was this amazing woman who studied um, continental philosophy with Herbert Marcuse, who went to Germany, who learned German, who, uh, who learned German, read philosophy in German and came back to the United States and got a job um, at UCLA, which you know, she was fired from um, twice. And so I, I followed her. I studied German, I went to Germany, I did the whole Angela Davis thing. And, and I needed a role model. And I think that that, uh, that was very important. Even at a time when there were like, literally three people in the world who could have been close role models for me, she was a role model. So, so, what, so what I'd say now is that, and this goes to sort of Corey's story, but the first time I, I walked into a classroom as a teacher, as a graduate student in philosophy, a white male student stood up and said from the back of the room, what gives you the right to teach this class? What gives you the right oh. to teach this class? I don't think any white graduate student has ever <laughs> had the experience uh, that I had at that moment. And I treated it as a straightforward question. I just explained my, you know, my background. Uh, but similarly, I had a black student come up to me, uh, not the same day, but a few weeks later, <laughs> say to me, why aren't you teaching black philosophy? Well, the, the awkward answer I gave is that, well, you know, even though, you know, when, when we teach European philosophy, the tradition of Plato, Aristotle, up through the early modern period, Hobbes, Locke, Rousseau, into the 20th century, uh, Quine, Carnap, uh, Rawls, even though I, I, that's the story I told this person saying that we can find meaning in these uh, texts written by white men. Um, and I was sorry to have to give him that answer. I wish I could have said, oh, there's a robust field called black philosophy, lots of texts. And next semester, I'm gonna be teaching that class. I couldn't say that in the 1970s. I can say that now and I'm very happy that there's been progress. Uh, briefly, you asked about, um, about obstacles. I think there are, um, the, the main obstacles are the ones that uh, Professor Ewell was mentioning. I mean, there's a lot of blatant racism in fields like philosophy and music theory and medieval studies that, that are barriers to people entering the fields and being successful uh, through feeling wanted and being retained. Thank you. Thank you, Anita. Philip, would you like to comment? Yeah, if I, if I could just say a couple of things. Thank you. Um, you know, it, it's funny to hear from, I, I'm sorry, I'm <laughs> Anita and Corden. I should probably say Professor Allen or Dr. Allen, Dr. Whitaker. Um, but uh, it, 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 when, I, when I'm trying to explain to people a little bit about music theory, because I think it might be the most arcane of our three fields, if that's even possible, um, that, that, that it's an extremely white field that doesn't understand that it's very extremely white. Um, I often say, well, goodness, there are other fields out there like take, I don't know, medieval studies or goodness, take philosophy. And I use them as examples, <laughs> you know, it's like, it's just extremely white as if the only people who could love wisdom were white men, right? It's not that simple. <laughs> anybody can love wisdom. Anybody can be a philosopher or a medievalist, obviously. But um, the one thing I wanted to mention in the original question, you know, in the current structures, what's been helpful, I think we've touched on what's been harmful and it's, it's really the structures and the pushback from the people who have power. I, I you know, that may come out more as, as we continue the discussion. But what's been really helpful for me, uh, frankly, <laughs> has been to see the incredibly positive, overwhelming response from young scholars, all the way to undergraduate students, uh, you know, up through, let's say, tenure track uh, professors, people under 40 uh, who've, who've read something that I've written, who've reached out to me and uh, from all over the world. You know, I'm, I'm gonna Zoom with a Dutch cello quartet, uh, quint octet actually on Saturday, and I'm gonna interview with uh, Did Zeitz in, in Germany the week after and, and I'm talking to people all over the globe and so many people have come out and said to me, thank you for opening these conversations in a way that I hadn't seen opened before. In other words, just talking openly about race in the field of music theory in the United States um, and linking race and gender and other aspects of what we do because what has happened in music 
probably more than medieval studies and philosophy, please correct me if I'm wrong, is that we hide behind the notes on the page. It's just about the notes on the page. That's the only thing that matters, right? Just interpret the notes. And then it's all about great music and exceptionalism. And it has nothing to do with gender or race, obviously, you know, race neutrality, gender neutrality and all that. Um, so it's, it's, it's perhaps a little easier to hide behind those notes on the page and just scrub race from the equation and not have to deal with it. But after a few things have happened recently, it's just been thrown into the limelight, my field of music theory, and we've been dealing with them and, it, and it's good. And the younger people who are really in, engaged and, and with whom I'm having these really, really interesting conversations, they actually give me great hope um, that, that things can change um, uh, for the better. So it's, it's exciting and, and invigorating. Pauline, can I just insert one point about the notes on the page? So in philosophy, we have an equivalent to the notes on the page. It's logic. And so uh, logic and, the, and logical argument is the structure, the backbone of the discipline. And so, um, so often when people try to look at more normative or qualitative uh, issues and to say that it's not just about the argument or just about the logic, it's also about the the facts and the values and the norms and the politics and the power, and all that stuff, they're, it, that's sort of pushed to the margins. And so the true experts in the field are the bloodless, cold logicians and people who write analytically. And that's the, that's the equivalent in my discipline to what you were describing. And it, it's very, very pervasive and very, very dominant, uh, dominant in terms of, of practice and, 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 and principle. And I think uh, fairly oppressive, at least it is in music theory. It's, it's kind of everywhere, it's dominant, and it's kind of this, you have to do what we do this way as it's been prescribed without ever even mentioning the fact that the people doing the prescribing since the 19th century in the United States have been 100% white and, not or, but and 100% cisgender men, fact not open for discussion. It's just a fact that historically that's the field. And now we can actually say that people will not fall off of their chairs, thank you. And we can have honest discussions about this. It's actually very, very interesting. Well, can I know the answer to this question and I don't mean to put you on the spot, but can you tell us how many um, PhDs there are in music theory in the United States? How many programs or how many people? How many people? I can cite just a little bit of the statistics from the Society for Music Theory. Let me actually start with the programs. I would guess, I, I, years ago, I actually tried to, to count, I think there are on the order of 25 to 30 institutions that grant PhDs in music theory. I imagine that people on Twitter are gonna, gonna jump in or I'm gonna get hit on Facebook and say, how could you say that? There are 30, there are whatever. But you know, that's a pretty fair guess. Uh, they so can blame me. Yes. Please, yes, please blame <laughs> Pauline. <laughs> um, it's uh, probably 25 to 30 programs that, that grant the PhDs in music theory. Any one of those every year could, could put out on the order of one to three P uh, PhD holding music uh, theorists. Um, the Society for Music Theory is probably the smallest of our professional societies. Among the three of us, it's roughly a little less than 1,200 members in the society of the professoriate, uh, probably on the order of four to five, 450 people who are, you know, either tenure track or tenured. Among tenured, that, you know, associate full professors, probably around 350 to 400 people. Uh, virtually no Black people, very few Latinx, almost no mm -hmm. Native American. Happily, we have a few people coming from Pacific Rim, Asiatic countries. But then, of course, it is uh, extremely white. And the higher you go in the, in the, in the seniority and the power structure, mm -hmm. it becomes more and more white. Uh, among the tenured faculty, about 94% white. Thanks for, you know, going into detail on that, because I think um, maybe not everyone on this seminar understands, you know, what the statistics look like. And, you know, mu music theory is, is definitely not alone. Uh, it sounds like philosophy and um, maybe medieval studies is doing a little better in terms of um, diversity, but it is, uh, it is a huge challenge that many of our viewers are 
are facing and trying to address and trying to learn how to how to bring about change. So let me ask uh, another question. Let's focus on uh, graduate education. A large part of the work pertaining to um, inequity is carried out in the course of graduate education um, from habits of everyday life and particular course requirements to traditions like the shape of uh, dissertation. All are factors that um, shape graduate education. What would you most like to change to advance equity in your discipline with regard to graduate education? I think I would start with A.D. Carson's rap dissertation from the University of Clemson from three years ago. I, I don't know where he is now, but he's a professor. He was able to push through the Clemson, uh, you know, bureaucracy, uh, a dissertation that was a, like a 34 track rap album. So from there, I would simply say that there's so much more than the, you know, the black and white dissert. I'm holding up a, a like a three centimeter wide book of a dissertation here. Um, that we still think of, uh, certainly in music theory, uh, that, that that has to be what we do. Of course, you can do many academic projects. I'm thinking about pods. Everybody does podcasts. And if they're done really well, and if you do a 20-part podcast just laying out music theories of planet Earth, that could easily be worthy of a dissertation um, and, and a PhD in music theory. Furthermore, we don't have to say, and we shouldn't say, that everybody should be striving to become a professor in music theory, knowing mm. that there are not jobs for everyone. We need to basically be making things more flexible and, 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 and easier for our graduate students. So the final point here that I'll point out is the, the curricula that have been handed down in music theory are absolutely representative of that 19th and 20th century white supremacy and patriarchy that I, I've been explaining. So everything about the graduate education is still deeply, deeply rooted in uh, that past. That's just what the past is. Mm -hmm. so I, I've written about the foreign language requirements. We in music theory focus on German. I'm sure that's the same. And, in, uh, in Anita and Kord's fields as well. And, 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 and I've been very critical about that, knowing German myself. Um, I'm critical of, of classes that literally feature 100% uh, white men to be studied and no one else. I'm critical of placement exams that place your commitment, let's be blunt, your commitment to whiteness and your commitment mm. to maleness. I'm critical of those because they are the things that people look at, people of color look at, and they they instinctively like. Well, I they say to themselves, I, "Why would I want to go to graduate school in that when it, when the only thing it's going to do is police and enforce the whiteness and maleness of the field?" And then if I buy into it enough, maybe I'll get this degree, and maybe I won't. As Anita has alluded to, uh, the people of color who do who have committed to those things. Um, are often told at the end, uh, you're not gonna get this degree. You're not gonna get tenure. You're not gonna, you're not gonna succeed because of any number of reasons. And I began half an hour ago by saying that that's what set me off on, on a path to, uh, to do some of this research. The fact that my skin color was enough to, to drive a, a certain senior faculty to seek my termination. Um, I ended up being victorious in that in that case at my institution, but how many BIPOC were not? Uh, how many people were denied tenure because they didn't fit that mold? They usually w use the word fit. Oh, the fit wasn't quite right. Well, that's, oh, that's code. We know that's code. It's code for, in music theory, it's code for you weren't committed enough you, to the whiteness and the maleness. You weren't doing what you were told. You didn't stay in your place. We know the tropes. It's kind of racism that's embedded in certain tropes like that. Thank you, Philip. Thank you for being so um, honest and open. Before, before I move on to ask uh, Anita and Cord to respond to this question, um, I'd like to remind everyone who's watching that we are hoping you submit questions through the Q&A prompt at the, at the bottom of the screen, um, because around four o'clock, James Shulman is going to select some questions um, from the audience to ask the panelists. So Anita and Cord, what are your thoughts about changes that need to be made in graduate education? 
I think in philosophy, I'm, I'm myself fairly traditional in terms of the graduate education, but I, so I'm, it doesn't bother me that still after all these years, the, the graduate students have to study um, symbolic logic and ethics and metaphysics epistemology um, and usually a foreign language. And then, then they can begin their specializations. That doesn't bother me so much. What kind of bothers me and I would like to see change is that, as I mentioned earlier, uh, if, you, if you study, as I have, uh, the output of um, philosophers of color, and especially African-American men and women and Black men and women from around the globe, um, there is uh, a very, very, very high percentage who work on race. And yet, there are very few opportunities, while one's a graduate student, to carefully study race issues. And students have to sometimes fight with their uh, departments, usually headed by uh, white men, uh, to fight to be able to take courses that might help them expand their understanding of race, deepen their understanding of race, maybe through the English department or the Africana Studies department or the law school or someplace else. So that's, that's what I like to see changing, the ability of students to, to study race while they're in graduate school, to get grounded in, in the rich history of um, race-related studies while they're in graduate school to elevate their understanding, improve their dissertations and, and launch them into the kind of career they're gonna actually have, which is a, as a philosopher of um, race for the most part. The other thing I like to see changing is the balance of um, scholars whose work is represented. Now, when I was in grad school in 1970s, believe it or not, the entire uh, four years I was on campus at the University of Michigan, I was assigned readings by two women in the curriculum, G.E.M. Anscombe and Blip Afoot. I think I'm, oh, maybe three, Judy Thompson. Okay, so three women out of the hundreds of, <laughs> of articles and books that I was assigned to read, encouraged to read uh, in, in graduate school, three pieces by women, three articles by three women, that's it. That would never happen today. But still, if you look at, at the how, how we teach logic, ethics, epistemology, et cetera, the, the major, authors who are presented are going to be white and are going to be uh, men. Maybe within ethics, there's quite a bit of diversity, but much less diversity in some of the other fields still. Thank you. Thank you. Cord, your, your thoughts? I, I, I completely track with, with both what Professors Yule and Alan are saying. And I want to draw a thread out of that. I mean, what we're, what we're really talking about and what really strikes me as absolutely necessary is the nature of the canon in your particular field. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I've talked a lot about my perspective from medieval studies, but of course my home discipline is English language and literature, where fortunately a lot of work has been done to, you know, to expand the canon over the past uh, several decades, since the, since the 60s and 70s. That kind of work is still in its much more nascent stages in the, you know, in the medieval studies side of, of my work. But because I have the model of the way it's been done in English literature on the whole, especially with regard to modern, modern, modernist, African-American, those canons, the development of those canons, you know, I'm able to, to bring that um, to bring those efforts and that model over into the medieval study side of my work. However, you know, I will say that as much as there's been a lot of work done um, by, you know, and, and those of us who, who work on race in the Middle Ages tend to call ourselves scholars in medieval, in critical medieval race studies, or some say pre-modern critical race studies. And while a lot of that work has really been growing over the past 20 years, and while we've been drawing attention to different medieval texts that were not canonical before, I still found myself advising a prospective graduate student of color just, just several days ago um, that, well, you know, if you're going to write in your personal statement about wanting to be a medievalist, you must mention these three scholars and their work. And of course, those three scholars and their work do not deal in, in the slightest iota with, with race or racial identity right? or the development of the idea of race. They don't deal with those things at all. 
And this is a student who wants to, you know, who wants to do work in that vein and who I believe if she does indeed complete the PhD, she will. But the parameters for getting in the door, the parameters for inclusion are still, you must show that you have a working knowledge of that which is canonical in this field. And that which is canonical is still exclusive of race and by extension exclusive of people who identify as race which gets me you know which gets me to another point i mean this is also about the and anti-racism on the whole is also about dealing recognizing and studying the construction of whiteness as a race removing it from the realm of normativity. And many of our canons still code white as normative. And that's one of the things that we, one really one of the major, one of the central paradigmatic things that we have to continue to work to change. And so changing the canon is key to that in a variety of fields. And I do think English literature has presented us a good, not a perfect model by any stretch of the imagination, but a good one. Another thing that must really change are funding models, the ways that we fund graduate students, um, PhD candidates, uh, what we expect them to be able to deal with, the disparity in intergenerational wealth between people of color, especially black people and Latinx people in the United States, it is staggering. You know, government statistics will show that at least, you know, while it's still the minority, it's in the 40, 40 per, some 40% of white households in the United States have some amount of holdings in the stock market, whether that be through retirement accounts or direct holdings. The same figure for African-American households is around 9%. Obviously, when someone of, you know, when someone from a black family agrees to, you know, live on a stipend of, you know, 20 some K, and that's a good number, <laughs> 20 some K or less for, you know, for six to seven years, in many cases, they do not have the familial intergenerational wealth backing mm -hmm. that a number of their colleagues have. They're doing more work outside of their dissertations, outside of their coursework and then their dissertations in order to sustain themselves. That really must be recognized. That must be recognized, that must be taken into account by PhD granting institutions that really do want to, to, diver to do the anti-racist work of diversifying their PhD candidate pool, both drawing people in and retaining them. I can just make one quick point since um, Cord talked about the canon and, and, I, and it's so germane. Um, so the, the canon, the idea of Western civilization and the Western canon is very much a human construct. Uh, that, that was, our, uh, ACLS's very own Joy Connolly, I think was at the panel sitting at the table when, a, when a, a famous session happened in January of 2019, I think it was San Diego, when a questioner questioned Dan El Padilla Peralto and, uh, and race was mentioned and it made national news. Um, and I think it was Sarah Bond who was saying that uh, Western civilization is a, a construct. Of course, I, I've always known that, and, but I never really put that to the music Western canon. Well, it just so happens that today, December 17th, 250 years ago <laughs> in Bonn, Germany, Beethoven was baptized. Today, 250 <laughs> years ago, he was baptized probably born the day before. I've actually been to that, uh, his bond, his house in Bonn, Germany, yeah. where he was baptized and grew up. And um, th there can be no 
bigger name probably, certainly in the academic study of music than Beethoven in terms of a canon and canonic composers, right? I wrote a blog post where I said, Beethoven is an above average composer, let's leave it at that. And that made a lot of splash and like fills this crazy cancel cult culture person and okay, say what you want, I would never say that. I, of course, I actually, I quite like Beethoven's music. Uh, he wrote five cello sonatas and I'm a cellist. Why would I not like his music? They're actually quite beautiful. But in terms of the Western canon and Beethoven, if you think about how <laughs> it actually functions, what, what is it there? Our Western canon in music is a human construct. It was put out there by humans. And the whole point of my blog is simply saying, nobody knows all the music that was written 200 years ago when Beethoven was writing his music. We don't know it all. We just have been told by whiteness and we've been told by maleness in the United States and elsewhere, obviously, that this is the case and we just have to accept it. It is the best, just believe us. And it has nothing to do with race or gender. Obviously it can't. So when you think about that, and today's a special day, um, that, that there are these things that get enshrined, so enshrined and so entrenched that you can't even question them anymore. You know something's rotten in the state of Denmark if that's the case, right? It's, it, it shouldn't be like, it should never be like that about any person. People will say, Phil's trying to cancel Beethoven, never said it, never would. I, I quite like his music. But what I do say is, why is it that in the academic study of music, there are only about 15 Beethovens out there in the history of what we do? And everybody else got pushed to the side. Everybody else who was not both white and cisgender man. I mean, that's just the way it's been working. That's the canon. So we need to question what that human construct was, why it was so constructed, I can, I can give a little, a little uh, spoiler alert, power, power, and why that's been unfair. I mean, it's been unfair. If we're talking about anti-racism, we're talking about exposing the injustices of those canons and questioning them in a very fundamental way, not to get rid of Immanuel, Immanuel Kant. No, not at all. He, had, he wrote some interesting work and we, should, and we should read it by golly. But once you start excluding all the, all the philosopher, all the people who loved wisdom, whose names were not Immanuel Kant, well, you've got a problem. And you can see why we're in the mess we're in right now in soon to be 2021. But that's why panels like this are so very important um, and why I'm so happy to be part of it. You know, one of the special burdens of philosophy is that you know, philosophers in the canon help to justify slavery again and again and again. Mm -hmm. How do you teach undergraduates philosophy and have them read their Hume and their Locke or their Kant and see all the disparaging language about people from the African continent. And how do you just, I mean, how do you, how do you uh, explain to a 19 year old why you think it's important that they confront those ideas when they're so hurt, hurtful and painful and false? To say uh, nothing, to say nothing of all the horrific anti-Semitic ideas yes. that those very yes. same philosophers put yes. out. Yes. And, and, and the anti-woman ideas. And the misogynistic are. ideas. That, yeah. And what, it, what has happened? It has normalized and mm -hmm. legitimized misogyny. It has normalized and legitimized anti-Semitism. And it has normalized and, and legitimized anti-Blackness. And that's what these canons have done to a large extent. And that's what we need to unearth in our work. Well, worse yet is the fact that they quite often you know, our, our students are quite often led to read Hume and Locke and Kant and Hegel without also being asked to read their texts that are most directly engaged in the development of the Enlightenment racial sciences. Sorry to interrupt. This is such an interesting conversation. But James, we, we do have to hear from the audience. So many good questions and some of them you, you, you've, you've answered yourselves. Uh, somebody just asked about the, uh, about the um, how, how you uh, work, how you support students who have to read these materials in, can, in can, uh, canonic text and uh, are often doing so without any, without any framing. So, but you, you just answered that one. But let me ask a, a particularly challenging one that someone's offered, which is, I, I'm, the question is, I'm sure you encounter, as I do, 
academics who assert that the real diversity and inclusion problem in 2020 is a problem of viewpoint diversity with the implication that the efforts to achieve better racial and gender balance in our fields actually pulls against this real diversity. Can you uh, recommend effective responses to this kind of assertion? I can offer one off the bat. There are, there are, there are quite a breadth of approaches even within the efforts to increase gender and racial and orientational diversities. Um, you know, it is by no means a monolith. And, you know, if you talk with, you know, if you talk with critical, just to take part of it, if you talk with critical race theorists and enter into con real conversation with them, you'll hear a great diversity of viewpoints on approaches even within that, you know, that, that supposed field. I, I say supposed because it's sometimes when we say field, we make something sound monolithic, but it's not at all. Um, so, you know, so I want to put that out there that the, the same kind of diversity of viewpoint that, you know, that we expect to see across, across an entire discipline that makes a discipline run also exists within scholars who would argue for increasing, uh, for increasing diversity, equity, and inclusion to create a more equitable um, academe. I could also add one thing there that that sounds quite like a smokescreen to me. Um, my initial reaction to that would be, I would like to know the race, gender, and other identities of the people who are asking such a question. Because in point of fact, if somebody is trying to take away from the fact that the historical roots of my field are white supremacist and patriarchal by talking about variety of viewpoints, which of course is part of the picture, but it most certainly does deflect from a focus on whiteness and deflect from a focus on maleness, let's be clear. Who does that de uh, deflection um, help, right? Whom does it help? So I want to know who's asking that question. We need to interrogate. We need, we need to grade on a curve, let's say. We need to grade on a curve. Because if, in fact, a white cisgender man is telling me that we need to be thinking about viewpoints, I'm sorry, but I'm going to listen a little bit less. I'm going to take it into account because I want to be respectful of everybody, obviously. But if, in fact, my work and my focus will result in a, in a lowering of power and prestige for white men in the field because I want to make it inclusive. That is a stated goal, one of my stated goals. Well then, if in fact that person is taking the focus off of whiteness and maleness and will be the beneficiary of doing so because they are in fact themselves white and cisgender men, that should be taken into account uh, in the larger picture, frankly. I'm, I'm being blunt, but I'm being honest, and I think it's a very good point. Well, I think that um, that one of the main purposes of racial and ethnic diversity is viewpoint diversity. And we know for sure that with racial and ethnic diversity comes a variety of perspectives, and those perspectives are needed and welcome. Oftentimes in my universities, the ones that I, I've, I've uh, been at Penn, uh, Georgetown, uh, University of Pittsburgh, Carnegie Mellon full-time, and at Harvard, Yale, Princeton uh, on one-year visiting appointments, and many other places uh, across the world uh, visiting appointments. But, but usually when people start asking for viewpoint diversity, they're actually asking for, can we hear some conservative viewpoints, or can we hear about religious viewpoints? And, and I do think that conservative, libertarian, uh, and even far right-wing perspectives have a place in a university. Um, as do religious perspectives, but they're not a substitute for or superior to the kind of viewpoint diversity that comes when you have a richly um, ethnically and racially diverse faculty. So the next question was directed at, at Professor Yule, but I think any of you might be interested in it. It's, uh, it's sort of a bad apples question that, you know, is, is it really true that the roots of these fields uh, are really racist, or were there just a few bad apples, uh, either in in the in the canon or in the people who created the canon? How how do you how do you respond to that? 
Uh, well, my, well, my, the, the short answer is no, it's not just a few bad apples. You could make a, you could make a, an analogy obviously with uh, law enforcement and what's been going on with black lives uh, over this last year, because they've very much fallen back on the few, you know, few bad apples, don't throw everything away. Um, I, I think the best way to, to, to get at that is to dig deep into the history um, of, of the country. Ibram Kendi has a beautiful section uh, toward the end of how to be an anti-racist where he, he mentions uh, W.B. Du Bois's double consciousness and he says that in his tripartite divisions, segregationism, assimilationism and anti-racism, he says that black people historically have had something of a battle in their, in their beings about whether they want to assimilate or whether they want to be anti-racist, right? They wanted to stick up for equality and fight or assimilate to what were essentially white methods. The, the longer, much longer quote uh, right after that, um, toward the end of that book, talks about the his, historic views of white people in the, the United States of America. And he says, white people have their own dual consciousness but it's between the segregationist and the assimilationist, between the, the pro-slavery exploiter and the anti-slavery civilizer, right? Between the blue lives matter and the all lives matter. And it's a difficult quote for, I, I've given a talk and, and I've included that quote several times. But if you look at the history of the country, it's a very rare thing, one, two, 300 years ago to find a white person who was a true anti-racist, like really fighting, not just against slavery, but, but for the fact that all races are equals in all their apparent differences. White supremacy was a very powerful organizing force in the history of the United States. Again, not open for a question, just a fact. That's what the, that's what the country was founded on in many ways. Look at the first naturalization law of the United States, 1790. The constitution had just been written three years prior. Oh, we need to write a law about naturalization. Okay, in order to be a citizen of these United States of America, you gotta be a free white person. That's the law, that's the wording. Why free? Because whites could still be slaves in 1790. And then there was like, you gotta live here, you gotta do this, but that's called structural racism, structural whiteness, right? And that's been part of the history of this country for hundreds of years. And if you think about that history, how could it be a few bad apples with a history like that? A few bad apples doesn't make any sense at all. So if you look at the letters that the people wrote, if you look to the hardcore white supremacists in the history of the United States in our uh, academic study of music, the Percy Grangers, you know, a Nazi Australian who ended up here, taught at NYU and Interlochen for a while, the, the, the Howard Hansons, rabid anti-Semite, Howard Hansen. He was the director of the uh, Eastman School of You. Carl Ruggles, great American composer, also very uh, white supremacist. The, 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 the names are legion. There are just extremely many of them. And uh, the people who were white and in power because, while well, they were white men. They were the only ones who cared. Uh, you know, if, if in fact there are just a few bad apples, the, that implies that everybody was anti-racist in the 19th century. And that's just not the case. So we need to look at this with clear eyes and, and, and dismiss the, the few bad apple argument. It's 20, it's, it'll soon be 2021. We don't need to fool ourselves like that. I'm sorry if that's a little bit you know, over, but it does, it upsets me to hear a, a, a few bad apples when it comes to things like the, the honest history of the country that we should all be accepting. As James Baldwin said in 1965, all we want is for America to accept our past. I'll just leave it with James Baldwin. So, you know, I was sort of jolted by the question, the idea that it's about a few bad apples. On the other hand, um, I think that, uh, that it would be very understandable if there are many, many young people in the United States who believe that believe that, that it's a matter of a few bad apples and that people who talk as we're talking today about pervasive, deep-seated, historical, systemic racism have to be exaggerated because most people are good. So I, so I, you know, I, I see this question, if, I, if it came up in a class, it would be a wonderful teaching moment because it, it's, it's understandable why some young people might see it that way, but it's absolutely false, of course, as was just explained. Uh, the thing I wanna to say too is that, is that we have to all recognize that not all white people, all cisgender white males 
are bad people who you know are not anti-racist. I have had wonderful white male role models throughout my education and mentors. I mentioned earlier that yeah. Angel Davis was my primary sort of, I guess, global symbolic role model. But on the ground, the, the teachers who taught me philosophy were some very, very, very generous and kind uh, white men, including, I'll just name two to give them their props, um, Brian Norton, who went on to become a professor of philosophy at um, Georgia Tech and, and is a specialist in environmental ethics, and Gresham Riley, who was uh, who taught me American philosophy and who went on to become the president of Colorado College. So, so there are many good people today who have had a great impact on on black people like me and who've done a great job of mentoring black students. But but the history is not one of bad, a few bad apples, not at all. Well, you all did a, a beautiful job answering how I mangled the question because to be fair to the questioner, the questioner wasn't uh, asserting the bad apple uh, theory, but was saying, how do you respond to this? Because we get, I hear this theory. And so, so, and I think your answers of digging into the history and seeing how real it is, 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 a, is the way to, a great response. So then, Professor Whittaker, uh, and a question came in saying, "How do you, how do you sort of work on this on all fronts? In the sense that you're working to change institutions, both vertical institutions and in, in the community of scholars. And but when you when you're doing that, what kind of pep talks do you give to your graduate students, particularly your graduate students of color? What what do you say to to prepare them for this this work that they're entering into?" Well, thanks for that, James. That's a great question. I mean, I take, I think as many of us who, who educate graduate students do, I mean, I try to take very careful account of the, the individual that I'm working with, you know, where, where they're coming from, the experiences they're bringing with them, the baggage they're bringing with them, but also exactly what it is they're interested in working on. One of the things that, that I think is so very, very important in graduate education is giving the, you know, giving the, the, the emerging scholar the space and the license to dig into what they're working on to, to the greatest depth possible, right? That they can really just focus and, and just take it apart piece by piece by piece and, put it back together piece by piece by piece. So the advice that I often give them as to the, you know, as to the kinds of institutional racism they're going to run into, the kinds of interpersonal racism they're going to run into doing this work is to always take it back to their evidence. I mean, speaking in the parlance of an English professor, I tell them always take it back to the text, right? Return to your close reading. And that can involve, you know, that can involve treating the situation or, or what you've just been, or what's been said to you as a text itself and performing close reading on the fly. Um, you know, it can also involve when you're dealing with more institutional matters, when you're dealing with, um, you know, when you're dealing with resistance to your argument resistance to, you know, resistance to, you know, what you've put on the page or resistance to the topic you're, you're presenting that you will write on, is to show without a shadow of a doubt what the evidence is doing. And to show that you've mastered, that you've mastered the methods of analyzing that evidence. Right? Now you're gonna run into moments of resistance where no matter how much you show it, right, certain people, certain institutions will resist. But if you've shown it well, you will find folks who will, who will see your argument and who will buy your argument and who will help you subvert the folks who are resisting it and will help you subvert the institutions who are resisting it. So I tell them, always take it back to the text, take it back to your evidence, and part of the pep talk is that's what you came here to do anyway. So what this is doing is it's showing you that these skills that you're developing, this expertise that you're developing, isn't only some 
you know, academic exercise that's disconnected from real lived experience. But instead, it's the academic exercise that's teaching you how to have real world effects. It's teaching you and allowing you and enabling you and facilitating how you influence the world around you and others in it. Great. Dr. Allen, we have a fellow philosopher writing you saying, as it, uh, an undergraduate course I'm expected to teach regularly in my department is ancient Western philosophy, which means I'm expected to focus on Plato and Aristotle. I'm happy to do this, loving these philosophers, well, outside of their racism and sexism. Um, but I also do not know what to do to encourage diversity through this course. In particular, I'd love to get a more diverse student group of students in the classroom, but I feel like I'm working against both the idea of philosophy being the bastion of logic and maleness, and the ideas that have led white supremacists to revere the, revere the ancient Greek philosophers. I guess I'm looking for practical suggestions on the departmental level or instructor level to attract more diverse students, short of hiring new people because of a lack of funding to do that. Yeah, that's, that's really tough. So I think that uh, one of the reasons why I have been teaching undergraduate philosophy in the ethics field, because it's much easier in ethics to find ways to draw in um, students of color, because you can talk about, about uh, topics like uh, incarcer over-incarceration or affirmative action or uh, racial disparities in income and so forth that, that are much more accessible to and of interest to, uh, to some of our students of color. But, uh, you know, I think that it is very incumbent upon us to find ways to connect the ancients to the present day, to make it something that uh, a broad range of students will want to study and to uh, feel, let, feel confident in reframing some of the traditional debates one finds in Aristotle and Plato to make them more relevant. So for example, um, my area of specialization in philosophy is the, the ethics of privacy, the ethics of privacy. All, four, all three of my four books have been about, about philosophy of privacy and many of my articles. It's an area of philosophy that I, that I kind of innovated in a way to escape having to compete with um, white men uh, who were not writing about privacy when I started um, in, the, in the late 1980s. But in any event, what I've found is that I can talk about, about digital technology using Plato. You can talk about, for example, the story of, of Gyges and the Ring as a story about how when people get access to new technologies, they may be inclined to use those, te those technologies which allow them to be anonymous and invisible to, har to harm themselves and others. So you can find ways to connect old ideas with new ideas. Or in Ar I use Aristotle uh, to talk about some of the reasons why some of our behavior on social media may be ethically problematic. So why is it wrong for an Anthony Weiner to send pictures of his, of his underwear and his genital area to strange women, or why is it bad for Jeffrey Tubin to masturbate on, on Zoom? If you look at Aristotle, whose, whose ideas about reserve and uh, modesty, th those ideas can be related to contemporary issues that all students care about, of students of color as well. Uh, another example from using digital technology and teaching and you know teaching the ancients is the ancients have things to say about um, about the idea of dignity or virtue and you can talk about about use virtue ethics to talk about contemporary issues so so with a little bit of creativity I think we can incorporate contemporary issues that are directly about uh, race and subordination and anti-racism or indirectly about them into those traditional tech but you have to be creative and you can't just take them and teach them exactly the way they were taught to you when you were a graduate student. You have to re rethink and reinvent these texts to enliven them and make them um, relevant. It can be done. I'm not, so I don't think we should scrap teaching intro to philosophy beginning with the ancients, but I do think we should change the examples we use and the connections we make between our lives and their lives. Can I add one thing to uh, Anita's very thoughtful answer there? Um, since we're talking about the Greeks, I think all three of our fields um, has something of a, almost like a, a Garden of Eden uh, aspect to, to gr ancient Greeks, right? Like, and then there was Socrates, right? Um, and I just know that in music theory, I'll speak only for my own field. 
when you study the history of music theory, yeah, well, you begin with the Greeks, Pythagoras and Aristoxenus, and then you go all the way up until today to a figure like Milton Babbitt, who died in 2011, for example, and you will, I've written about this in a blog, that you will only study the ideas of white men. That's it. 2,500 years, that's it. Those classes are very common still. Shout out to my friend and colleague, Alexander Reading at Harvard, who actually does try to change those things. In fact, uh, Ptolemaeus of Cyrene, he tells me, um, I, and well, I, I, I know this myself, is a woman and she was Greek and she wrote a book on Pythagoras's music theories. So why not include her? She's still Greek, but she's a C, so she's been erased. That's Kate Mann's term uh, for erasing women's accounts from history, erasure. It's a very useful term. I use the term color erasure when the same happens to people of color. Um, so in, the, in music theory, there's no reason why we can't study things older than the Greeks, like Sumerians and Egyptians, because they had music. We have to dig, we have to do the work. Much of it still needs to be done. How about music theories coming from Asiatic countries in China and India that are many, many hundreds of years old and potentially, I don't even know because I'm not a, a, a historian of music theory back that far, but potentially as old or the, uh, uh, as the Greeks or even older. Um, the idea that the Greeks kind of came out of nowhere in this Adam and Eve kind of uh, environment and everything else was just a bunch of people swinging from trees um, is, is really one of the most uh, detrimental things. It's part of the narrative, part of that Western civilization construct that we cited earlier, which, which was the narrative of white men and their greatness. And it's, it is yet another. Again, I completely agree with what Anita ended with there, which is we're not gonna stop teaching Plato. I don't wanna stop teaching Pythagoras. He wrote some really interesting things about music theory, as a matter of fact, especially tuning systems. But what I do want is an acknowledgement that that narrative has, has functioned in a very exclusive way. And, um, and I, I just couldn't uh, stop because I, I heard that the, the Greeks are so key to all our three fields. There's no question about that. And in music theory, it is presented as this, uh, b the beginnings of what we do. And it's just not, it is an interesting thing that happened 2,500 years ago that absolutely should be taught. But the beginnings, no, no. I mean, I should, maybe I should have added also that one could push for more Eastern um, and African thought in uh, early African and early Eastern thought in, in, in the place of, or in, in addition to some of the, um, the, the Greek focus, Greek and Roman focused um, early philosophy. Uh, but, but, but I think uh, one of the reasons it hasn't been done is because philosophers like to teach systems. And if you just have like a fragment from Heraclitus or a fragment from a particular Asian thinker or a fragment, it's hard to sort of to teach it in terms of a system that you can critically evaluate and analyze. And so that's been a limitation, but there's plenty of, of systematic thinking among, among Asian philosophers. I don't see no reason why we couldn't teach more Indian and Chinese, uh, Japanese thought, for example. I think I just want to jump in here and say, we also have to keep in mind that when, when it or similar moves have been done, the backlash they've received has been so, so intimidating. You know, right behind me on my shelf always sit the works of Martin Bernal. And of course, the, the backlash against his, against his claims for, you know, an Afro-Asiatic culture at the roots of, of Greco-Roman Western civilization, right? The, the, you know, an African influence in ancient Greece. So riled um, colleagues working in his field that it spawned, you know, I mean, his book is Black Athena's three volumes. It spawned many more than three volumes in, you know, in, in some cases, quite vituperative response. Now, of course, it's, a, you know, his work is massive. Not everything in it is, you know, not everything in it's going to be perfect or absolutely correct. It's also not the field he was originally trained in, but there's a whole lot there that is a far more worse than a lot of the uh, than a lot of the responses make it out to be. So that's you know those kinds of barriers. Those are the kind of barriers we're up against in terms of the canon. Those are the kind of barriers we're up against in terms of other scholars' feelings. Um, so that's pretty important to keep in mind. 
I think we're heading we're heading to having to let people go on with their evenings, but I, I have to make one promise to our, our great audience, which is um, the 43 questions that we didn't get to literally. Um, we will definitely share with, with our panelists and, and they will get to ruminate on them. So thank you to our audience for, for so many good questions and thank you to the panelists for, uh, for the conversation. Thank you. I just briefly in closing, and I too, I don't want this to end. Uh, and I, I don't speak for all the discussants. You're probably ready to um, relax for the evening, but I, I, I know I could listen uh, to all of you for, for hours longer. And I feel like there are seeds of discussion here. We now at ACLS need to figure out, and then our respective societies need to figure out how to pick up and amplify on. Um, I'll, I'll just say two more things. I, I uh, am left feeling with um, overall, wishing that as a graduate student, as an as a you know young assistant professor, I had heard more of these discussions and heard any of these kinds of discussions. Frankly, I mean, it would have changed me so much more quickly than I did change. And I was a canon defender in my teens and early twenties, and uh, because that was what I knew, and that was what I had you know was beginning to learn my way around and. Um, and I, I really appreciate Professor Whitaker's invocation of the, and, and you all have touched on this, the, the emotional investment that has to be taken into account as we, um, not 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 used as an excuse, but but accounted for as we move forward with successful strategies. But and I also take Professor Whitaker's invocation of of advice, take it back to the text that the expertise that all of us as humanists. Um, in music, in philosophy, in, in English literature, in medieval studies, in my own field of, of Greek and Roman or ancient Mediterranean studies, that we the expertise, Professor Whitaker, you said, um, is, is not a matter of, uh, it's not an academic exercise. It is lived experience, it's part of lived experience, that habits of analysis, habits of thought, well-reasoned judgment, as, as Professor Allen said, um, a broad curiosity and a willingness to question tradition desire to question tradition and, and overturn um, stale traditions as, as Professor Ewell discussed. I, so all of these things, uh, the, just a few takeaways that I, again, I wish I had, had had really thoroughly infused my formation earlier in my career. And I'm grateful if, uh, if we've been able to, to share some of these insights with your insights with especially emerging scholars. Uh, so that they can see and work with us in the clear path ahead. So this is this is in eloquent. Thanks for your um, for your insights and your your discussion for us, your honesty and your call to arms. Thank you so much, and thank you to all our audience uh, for your participation, your questions. Pauline, thank you for your moderation. I look forward to being in touch with all of you. Yep. Have a good night.